I learned ASP.NET Core MVC so you don't have to. This video is the shortcut version saving you hours of tutorials and documentation. I've been coding with ASP.NET Core MVC for over 2 years and have created multiple tutorials on this channel. In this video I'll show you everything you need to build web apps with this framework. From what ASP.NET Core MVC is to creating your first app and understanding the key components and concepts you need to know. Let's get started. ASP.NET Core MVC is a framework for building web applications using .NET. MVC stands for Model View Controller. These are the three main parts of an ASP.NET Core MVC app. Models hold the data of your app. Views are the pages the user sees and controllers handle the user's requests and determine what pages to show and what data is needed. Each of these parts has its own role, separate from the others, and together they form a complete web application. Fun fact, Stack Overflow is built with C-sharp and uses ASP.NET Core MVC as the framework. Before we can write any code, we need to set up a few things. First, you'll need to install a code editor to write your code. Shocker. <laughs> the top choices are Visual Studio or JetBrains Write. Personally, I use Visual Studio. You can simply search for Download Visual Studio or JetBrains Rider. The download and installation process is pretty straightforward. Next, you'll need the latest version of the .NET SDK. This is what actually allows you to build and run .NET apps on your machine. To get it, just search download.NET SDK on Google and you should see the latest version. At the time of recording this, it's .NET 9. You can download and install it with just a few clicks from here. Once you've installed Visual Studio and the .NET SDK, you're ready to create your first project. Open Visual Studio and create a new project. Choose ASP.NET Core Web App Model View Controller as the project template. Click Next. Name your project something like whatever. Choose the latest .NET version, in my case .NET 9, and click Create. Once it's done, Visual Studio will generate a full folder structure for you, including models, views, controllers, and more. Now let's walk through the main parts of an MVC app so you can understand how the framework works and we'll look at the different files and folders along the way. Let's start with models, which I stored in the models folder. This is where you define the shape of your application data. For example, if you're building a finance app, you might have an expense model. Here's a basic model class. When you connect our project to a database later on, the model will represent a table and each property in the class will correspond to a column in that table. Depending on the type of data you want your model to store, you define the appropriate data type for each property, whether it's an integer, a string, date time, or something else. An important thing to know when creating models is that you can also add validation rules using data annotations. These are simple attributes that ensure users enter valid data. If a user forgets to enter a title, the app will show an error message because the property is marked as required. Or if the user enters an amount outside the allowed range, they'll see a validation error again. Validation helps keep your data clean and correct and it's super simple to use. Now let's find out what controllers do by looking at the controllers folder. Controllers are a key part of the MVC framework. Simply put, they are classes that handle requests from the views, interact with the data or models of your app, and return the appropriate response. You'll see a file called home controller. This file has a few simple methods like index and privacy. Each method returns a view, which is a page the user will see. So how does this work? When someone visits your app.com, the URL of your app slash home slash privacy, the controller directs that request to the privacy method, which runs and returns a view. The view is chosen by going to the views folder, then to the folder that matches the controller's name, in this case, home, and finally to the view file with the same name as the method, privacy.cshtml. As you build your app, you'll create new controllers for the major parts of your app. For example, one for handling expenses, one for users, one for admin features. If you want help with ASP.NET Core MVC or .NET development in general, you can get direct support and guidance inside the .NET Squad community. And you can start for free. Imagine learning a skill like programming and having a place to go whenever you're stuck or something isn't working in your code. You'll get monthly content on topics you vote for, maybe topics that are hard to find online or that you simply find difficult to understand. 
understand. Plus, you'll connect with like-minded people to make learning easier. As I said, you can try it for free. It's basically a week of free coaching. The link is in the description. I highly recommend checking it out. Now let's get back to the video. Since we mentioned how requests are directed in our app, let's go a bit deeper and talk about routing, what it actually is. Routing is responsible for matching incoming HTTP requests to the correct code in your app. MVC apps can use conventional routing, attribute routing, or a combination of both. Conventional routes are defined globally in the project by specifying routing conventions, typically in the program.cs file, where the request middleware pipeline is configured. We'll see this file in more detail later in the video. But let's look at this example for now. A default route is defined with placeholders for the controller name, the action method, and an optional ID parameter indicated by the question mark. This default route determines where we get redirected when we run the project, and it also sets the routing pattern for the entire app. For example, if we enter the controller name home in the URL followed by privacy, the name of the action method will be routed to the privacy method in home controller. If we change the order of the parameters in the default route pattern, say putting the action before the controller, that change will also affect how URLs must be structured when a request is made to our app. With attribute routing, routes are defined directly on controllers and actions instead of being set globally. The upsides here are that routes are defined next to the code they affect, making them easier to understand and you can apply multiple routes to the same action, but the downside is that the routing rules are scattered across multiple files instead of being in one place. And here's something important to remember. In MVC apps, you don't have to choose between conventional and attribute routing, you can use both. However, the cleanest way in most cases is conventional routing. The third major component of our app is the views. So let's take a look at the views folder. Views are your front end, the pages that are shown in the browser. In ASP.NET Core, we use a file format called CSHTML, which lets you mix regular HTML with C Sharp code, which is also called the razor syntax. Here's a quick example. In this line, we use the add symbol to embed C Sharp variables into our code. Here we're displaying the value of the view data dictionary. You can also write C sharp code inside a block like this and this block sets a value that can be used later in the view. Now we'll finally talk about databases, which we're gonna need if we want to store and manage our application's data. There are tons of options available. There are relational databases, non-relational databases, and lightweight ones like SQLite. ASP.NET Core supports many of them. However, we'll go with the most commonly used option in ASP.NET Core, which is SQL Server. All you need to do is search for SQL Server, click the first link, and download the Express version, which is also suitable for production-ready apps. Next, we'll also need need to install a tool to help manage our SQL Server database, SQL Server Management Studio. This is the app where we can run queries and manage our SQL Server database. Just search for SQL Server Management Studio, it should be one of the first links and the download and installation are straightforward. As you may know, to interact with the database directly, you'd typically write SQL queries as SQL is the specific programming language designed for this purpose. But to simplify this process, in most .NET apps, we can use a tool called Object Relational Mapper. An Object Relational Mapper lets us work with databases using objects in our main programming language, in our case C Sharp, instead of writing a raw SQL. There are a few different Object Relational Mappers available, but the most popular and the official one from Microsoft is Entity Framework Core. Put simply, Entity Framework Core is a framework that allows us to interact with a database using C Sharp objects. I hope that was simple actually, <laughs> I don't know. But to use Entity Framework Core, you'll need to install a few few NuGet packages. In Visual Studio, right-click on Dependencies, go to Manage NuGet Packages and install Microsoft.EntityFramework-Core and Microsoft.EntityFramework-Core.SQL-Server. This second package is so that we can connect Entity Framework Core with our SQL Server database. A main part of Entity Framework Core for connecting our project to a database is the dbContext class. We usually store it in a folder called data at the root of the project and by convention we name it with the context suffix as in this example. This class acts as the bridge between our project and the database. It contains methods and properties that allow us to interact with the database. In it, we define a DB set for each model we create, like our expense model, which will create a corresponding table in the database. Later, we'll also see how to configure this DB context in the program.cs file so your app knows how to use it. 
An important file you need to know is app settings.json, where various configurations are specified. One of them being the connection string, which defines the physical location of our database. When you create a SQL Server database to connect to your project, or use an existing one in SQL Server Management Studio, you specify its location or its connection string here. We've seen a bit of the program.cs file so far, so let's finally explain it in more detail. It is the entry point of an ASP.NET Core application. Each line in this file has a specific task. First, it sets up the web server, then it configures the services for your app. This is also where you'll register things like your DB context and how it connects to the database. Next, the middleware pipeline is defined. This is a sequence of components that handle HTTP requests and responses, such as routing, exception handling, static file serving, HTTPS redirection and authorization, and finally, the application is built and run, starting the web server to listen for incoming requests. At this point, after we've created a model, written the DB context for Entity Framework Core, configured it in program.cs, and added its connection string in appsettings.json, it's time to migrate these changes and talk about migrations. A migration in Entity Framework Core is essentially a C-sharp class that represents the schema of your database. It includes information about the data you're storing and the relationships between that data, based on your model class. In our case, the model we've created gets translated into a database structure or table more specifically through a migration. To use migrations, we first need to install the Entity Framework Core Tools NuGet package. Once that's done, we can generate a migration. To add a migration, go to Tools, NuGet Package Manager, package manager console in visual studio and run the command add dash migration and then your migrations name you can name it something like initial migration or use a name that reflects the changes you're capturing after running the command a new migration class is created in this class it specifies a table with the name of the model and columns matching the properties of your model finally to apply these changes to the actual database run the following command update dash database. This will create the table in the database based on the migration. If you want to keep learning ASP.NET Core MVC, I've made a full length beginner tutorial that goes into everything in more depth. It should be on the screen right now, so go ahead and click on it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you there.